Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Scott McGilvery, and this is The Real Estate Rebel, and I am very, very, very excited for today's topic. It's something that I have taught many, many times, but I'm going to get a little deeper into it today. I call this the four secrets you need to know to make money in real estate. I've also called this the four ways to win in the past, um, but this is absolutely critical stuff if you ever plan on getting into real estate investing. I mean, even if you're buying a primary residence, you should know these things. We have not been taught these things in school. This is not part of our education system. It took me many years of real estate investing and working with other investors to identify and use these four systems in order to have a, a sophisticated investing model, and I wanna share them with you today. So, big day today. I'm gonna to be doing this all on my own. I don't need any guests for this one, uh, but if you've got questions, concerns, if you wanna contribute here, you know, please add your comments in. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also visit me at scottmcgilvery.com for everything investing if you want more information or some education. Oh, boy, this is a big one. I've been teaching these, these, these methods for years. And as you guys know, I'm, I'm not only addicted to real estate investing, I'm an active real estate investor myself. We've seen so many things over the years affect the real estate market. Um, and it's funny, the, the longer that I invest in real estate, the more I gravitate towards saying the following. You will make more money on the things you can't predict in real estate than you will on the things you can predict. And it's, it's kind of funny because, you know, people talk about being an investor is risky. Um, what I'm going to teach you today is how to eliminate as much of that risk as possible by being a sophisticated investor. But, but the most important thing to know is that the, this is the baseline for real estate investing. These are the four things you absolutely must be considering. There are more than just four ways to make money in real estate. It's, you know, it could be fluctuations in the market. It could be government regulations. It could be changes in the interest rate. It could be a pandemic. There are so many different things that, um, that can impact real estate that are unpredictable. Uh, but no matter what happens in the market, it's critical that you're, you're do basing your business model on these four ways to make money so that no matter what else happens, if, whether it's good or bad, you're hopefully still making money at least a few of these four ways to win. Now, I am going to also add to this that there's obviously more than four ways. These are the four basics. If you guys are really pumped and already starting to invest in real estate, then you're going to want to know uh, a fifth and a sixth way to, to make money in real estate. I'm going to share those with you guys at the end. They really are bolt-ons to the you know fundamental four, let's call them. Um, but I'm going to share the fifth and sixth way to make money in real estate as well. For those of you who are already investing in real estate, these are things that you should be considering. They're a little more intermediate or advanced strategies. But stick around. I'll share those with you at the end of the episode. But let's get right into it. Um, when I started investing in real estate in my early, early 20s, the first reason I bought properties was because I recognized it was going to be more affordable for my friends and I to own a property than it was to rent a property. By that, I realized that, you know, the, the five of us living in the house paying $2,500 a month in rent uh, was more than the cost of paying a mortgage, covering property taxes, and doing a little bit of maintenance. That's the first way to make money in real estate. It kind of brings me to the first, which is positive cash flow. The idea that you can make more money by renting a property than all of the expenses of that property. Now, this is, this is not difficult math. This is pretty simple math. For those of you who don't like math, I got good news. This is grade three math or less. I mean, there's, there's nothing super complicated you need to understand here, so don't get intimidated. In fact, I, um, my wife's a teacher, and when she was teaching grade three, I remember asking her if she could present a little mathematical problem to the students. And I made up, um, you know, I probably shouldn't tell you this because she's supposed to follow the curriculum perfectly. 
but I did make up a little real estate scenario and I had four little houses and I wrote the, um, the purchase price of each one, the expenses of each one, the amount of rent that it brings in. And I asked, you know, which house here is the best investment, meaning which one has the most positive cash flow? And she explained it to the kids and they worked it out and they knew, okay, I take the, you know, expenses minus the rent equals, and they had to figure out which one had the highest positive number. I asked my wife, I said, how did it go? She said, it went pretty good. I explained it to the class within five minutes. Everyone pretty much got the right answer. And I was like, holy smokes, I talked to adults for hours about this and they still are freaking out and trying to figure out, you know, what they're missing or how this could really work. And, uh, <laughs> and it's crazy because it's grade three math, but a lot of people overthink the process. One of, one of the, uh, one of the most kind of challenging things for, for me trying to help people get into real estate investing is to get them out of their own way. A lot of people try to outsmart themselves and they sabotage opportunities by identifying a way that it makes money, but then spending more time on the, you know, uh, the weaknesses and threats of an opportunity to find a million, you know, they will dissect something a million different ways to find one way that it doesn't work. And instead of looking at the 25 ways that it does work, they'll look at the one way that it doesn't work and they'll say, but look, here's a, here's a way that it might not work. And my advice is, you know, don't outsmart yourself from the opportunities that exist. There's always going to be a way that something might not work. And there's always going to be certain ways in which it does work. And the four ways to win and the four secrets you need to know to make money in real estate is really the foundation. If you can satisfy at least these four rules, Everything above and beyond that is, is really not as important. It's, it's in the periphery, right? Like don't stress yourself out. As long as these four work, then you've got a good property in front of you. So positive cash flow. Does the amount of money that you are generating from rent cover all of your costs, meaning your cost of financing, your maintenance, your insurance, your property taxes, and if the, the amount of money can cover all that and there's a little bit of money left over, that leftover money is called positive cash flow. This is the most important thing to calculate when investing in real estate. It, it, you absolutely should be buying properties that satisfy this rule to build a profitable portfolio. And I know a lot of people skip this step. And these are the people who get themselves in trouble. They give real estate investing a bad rap. They're like, oh, I bought a property and then it went down in value and then I wasn't able to rent it out and I lost money. And I look at that person and I say, well, you're a gambler. You did no calculations. You didn't even look at the first and most fundamental and most important rule in real estate, which is, is it profitable, the, the property you're buying? I don't, I'm not interested in cash neutral properties. I'm not interested in cash negative properties. I'm not interested in just parking money in real estate and seeing what happens. That is crazy talk to me. And I know people do this. I see people trying land banking opportunities and they, they buy a property because they like it and they're emotional or they, they think maybe I'll just buy a condo because it's cheap and even though it doesn't make money, maybe it'll go up in value. Eh, 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 three strikes right there. Don't do it. Unless you're making money, don't buy it. Don't buy it. And not every property cash flows. In fact, most properties don't cash flow. The best cash flowing properties you will never find because they don't exist. The best cash flowing properties are created, not found. So that's going to bring me to my next rule in just a moment. But I just want to clarify one more time because this is the foundation. If you know this, then everything else becomes less important. Buy cash flowing properties or build cash flowing properties, making sure that all of your expenses are covered because this, folks, is the basic business model. Any business model that's profitable knows that it needs to borrow money and then whatever it's producing, whether it's a service or a product, it has to generate more income than all of the expenses and the cost of borrowing. That's just a good business model. If you're buying properties that lose money or cost you money, my next question is how do you scale that business? 
by scaling your business, you become less profitable. Not interesting to me. I'm the cash flow guy. I've always followed the positive cash flow rule. It has served me well through massive real estate downturns in the United States, through commodity fluctuations that have affected housing prices, through pandemics, through government regulations, through high interest rates and low interest rates. The positive cash flow rule is, is the safety net for real estate investing. I don't think I made it clear enough. Positive cash flow is so important. You have to know how to calculate that, all right? Now, let me move on to the second thing you need to know if you're investing in real estate. It's funny, I wrote all of this down and I have notes, but do I need to use them? Absolutely not. Um, this stuff is so ingrained in my head, it's like I live it and breathe it every day. But I just wanna make sure I don't miss anything. So number two, the second thing you must know if you wanna be a sophisticated real estate investor is understanding the concept of principal recapture. Now for a lot of people, this is the understanding of their mortgage being paid down. If you have a mortgage, if you have a primary residence or an investment property with a mortgage, go and look at your annual mortgage statement. You should get it at the beginning of every year um, or at the end of your mortgage period, and it will show you that you have made a certain amount of mortgage payments. And then it will show you how much has gone to your principal balance, that's paying off the actual debt, and it'll also show you the amount that's going towards interest, which is painful because it ends up being a lot of money that is paid towards interest. But that is the cost of doing business. That is a true expense. And your accountant should understand that you get to write off the interest portion of an investment property. However, the principal balance that's being paid down, that's equity being put in your pocket. You can't write that off. It's not an actual write-off. Believe me, I've tried. It doesn't work that way. What you should recognize though, is that if you have found a really terrific property, um, so for instance, when I was buying student rental properties, I was buying them what I call fully financed. I was using investor money for the down payment and I was paying an interest rate on that. And then I was using conventional financing for the other 80% loan to value. And the rental income that was coming in was enough to cover the entire mortgage payment and the interest owed on the down payment. Um, what's interesting is that I still had positive cash flow above and beyond all that. And at first, the first year or two, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a perfect uh, accountant at all this stuff, but sitting down with someone who understood it, it was interesting to start noticing that, yes, I could write off the interest portion of the loans as an expense, but the principal that was being paid down, I actually had to uh, report that as either income or equity because basically your rent, my renters were paying off my properties. And so not only am I accounting for the interest portion of the mortgage being paid by my renters, I was actually having, I was making sure that the rental income was covering the entire mortgage payment meaning principal and interest, which is fantastic. If you can do that, you're winning. You're winning because now you're making money on positive cash flow. That's the first way we make money. But you're also making money on principal recapture. Your renters are paying down the debt on the property, which is how most long-term, extremely wealthy real estate investors make a ton of money. They let the tenants pay down the asset. It's phenomenal. They cover the, the, the rental income is not only covering the uh, cost of financing, it's also covering the principal balance of the property, which is the best, the best. And this is something that when I got started with student rentals was critical because I didn't have any money to put into these properties. So I always made sure that I was, you know, creating rental properties that generated enough income to have positive cash flow and cover my entire mortgage so that they were also paying down the principal balance. This was like a happy mistake, um, but it was an absolute necessity. And I, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of all inventions. And 
this invented one of the best real estate investing strategies ever, right? Have the client pay for everything. So understanding that there's positive cash flow is the first way you make money in real estate. And you might be making, you know, three, four, five hundred dollars a month in positive cash flow. But at the same time, if you look at your annual mortgage statement and realize that another, you know, four or five hundred dollars a month in principal balance is being paid down, you're you have to add those two numbers together to really start to understand what your profits are. And this is a good problem to have. <laughs> and if you live in North America, then something else that you've never been taught is how a mortgage works. It is a very uh, interesting and complicated calculation. You know, we've all seen uh, like a, a mortgage statement and we've probably seen even a uh, repayment schedule, but to actually look at the math that's going on in the background, it's, it's pretty complicated. Uh, it's a big fraction. And the reason why it's complicated is because what it allows the lenders to do is charge you um, more interest upfront, which is, which sucks. For, <laughs> let's just put it, let's just say it as it is. It sucks. We, you, even though you may have a low interest rate, you're paying more interest at the beginning of a mortgage than you are at the end, which means the longer you hold on to a property, the more of the principal balance that's getting paid off. This is why long-term investors always do better, right? This goes perfectly with my saying, real estate investing is not get rich quick. It's get rich slow, but I'll take it. I'll take it because anything that's get rich quick is probably a scam anyway, so I'm not interested. So now we're making money with positive cash flow, and hopefully you're making money with principal recapture as well, and that's the principal balance being paid off of your financing. Let's talk about the third way to make money in real estate. This one is a bit of a favorite for a lot of people. Third way to make money in real estate is through passive appreciation. Passive appreciation. This is also known as market appreciation. And this is the concept of the property going up in value based on the market itself. This factor, this indicator is used in more media outlets than anything else I've seen. In fact, I don't really see anybody talking about uh, rental rates, you know, and the year over year rental rates is it's pretty, um, you know, it's a pretty small story, all things considered, but I'm interested in the small story. I love the fact that rental rates go up by about 2% every year for the last hundred years. That's fantastic news for me, because if you look uh, nationally, rental rates have never gone down on a national average rate, which is phenomenal. I want to invest based on that because that's, that's what secures your positive cash flow. However, passive appreciation, although very exciting, it's much more volatile. We've all heard of markets going up in value like crazy. We've all heard about market corrections. All of this falls under the passive appreciation portion of real estate investing. So important as a real estate investor to track this, but also important to note that it's something you have very little control over. There are a lot of external factors that will affect passive appreciation and you need to be prepared for it. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. The first time I experienced a market correction with my real estate investing portfolio was 2007, 2008. Um, my U.S. properties went down in value, and it was pretty scary. I have to say, you know, I was I was a little nervous. Uh, everyone was saying it was a, a disaster. It was the worst real estate crash in history. And here I am as a real estate investor thinking, holy smokes, what am I going to do? I've got all these properties. Now, I bought them because they were great rentals, and they were fully rented out. Um, and when the market turned, I was I almost listed them for sale. I was like, okay, maybe I should sell them all but that would be breaking my own rule. So I kept them and I kept renting them. And if you look at the statistics of rental rates between 2008 and 2012, they went up significantly every single year during one of the worst real estate crises in history. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that people couldn't get financing. People were scared to buy real estate. So there were more renters in the market. And my property managers and I had lots of meetings about this. And I was just flabbergasted. I'm like, how is it possible that everyone's saying real estate is such a, 
you know, terrible thing and bad investment. And here I am saying the exact opposite. Um, it was a huge turning point in my career because proving the business model was successful, continuing to have positive cash flow and principal recapture during what was the, the worst recorded performance in real estate history just proved to me that I was on to something significant. And most real estate speculators, those are the people who gamble in real estate, those are the people who are buying 20 pre-construction properties and then just hoping they were worth more when they were done. This was people getting 110, 120% financing for their properties. Those people all lost money and got themselves in real trouble. And that was the big bad news story. But when I started to see evidence that there was even more opportunities to make money in real estate during that market, it was 2009. They were saying we were now at the bottom of the real estate market in the United States. And to me, that's, that's the best thing you could ever hear is, oh, well, you know, we're at the bottom. So I looked at the numbers. I talked to my property managers and I realized that rents were still consistent. Prices were down. The cost of financing was down. People tend to forget interest rates dropped like crazy from 2008 to 2010 to, to levels we had never seen before. And when your cost of financing goes down, when your purchase price goes down and your rental rates stay the same or go up, your profit margin goes up. So stop listening to the news, stop listening to the media, stop listening to your neighbor who knows nothing about real estate trying to tell you it's a bad idea. Um, do, follow what the numbers tell you. It's about the math, not about the emotion, not about the news story. I, I find it you know, infinitely frustrating that people take advice from the wrong people. You need to take real estate in, uh, investing advice from real estate investors. So passive appreciation comes as a gift, not as something you can necessarily bank on as the only way to make money in real estate. So it's something that we have to watch for, for sure. And it's great. Everybody loves passive appreciation. Most people that own real estate feel like a bit of a genius when they find out their property's gone up in value. Um, but as Warren Buffett says, you know, it's when the tide goes out that we find out who's been swimming naked. And if you don't have positive cash flow and your property goes down in value, you could be in big trouble. So I, I want to say it was 2009 was when I had a big lesson. Um, I go back to an interview that I did on CNN in 2009. And I was doing an interview and they said on CNN, they said, Scott, you're in the real estate space. You're showing people on TV how to invest in real estate and put in apartments on income property. Why would you do that during one of the worst real estate crises in history? And I say, and I, I want to say this is exactly what I say. I said, this is actually the best time to be investing in real estate. And literally, I got so much pushback in that interview, and I just kept fighting. I said, if you do the math, people who invest now are likely to make a tremendous amount of money, not only on cash flow, but on the potential for passive appreciation. And that was, you know, over 10, 11, 12 years ago. And anyone who, who took that advice has probably become a millionaire at this point. Um, so don't discount passive appreciation. Don't only uh, rely on it. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a couple of little tips here um, of ways that you can increase your likelihood of having your property go up in value. And the key is to focus on areas that are set up for the best potential for growth. What does that even mean? Well, I always look at markets where there's a lot of immigration, so a lot of where population growth. I look for colleges and universities. I look for new hospitals being built. I look for airports or transportation hubs or new bus lines or subway lines being, being installed. All of those increase the likelihood of the value going up. I think one of my biggest secrets to success um, for growing my, my real estate business was, was starting to understand passive appreciation in my mid-20s and starting to target areas that had both positive cash flow and passive appreciation. I, I was living in a, in a college town and most of my properties in my early 20s were student rentals 
because that's what I was good at. So I bought lots of them. And then I realized that I could buy student rentals, but I could also have the properties go up in value if I had a good predictor of what would make a good student rental. I know this is complicated, but this is a pretty neat trick that I used to do in, uh, as an early investor, and it still works today. I would go to the city and I would ask them towards the end of the school year, I'd go to the city and I'd say, I would like to see all of the proposed and um, approved new bus routes for next year. Because every year the city expands a little bit, they add new bus routes. And I looked for every bus route that was a direct line to campus. And there was every year there was like, you know, two new bus stops off of this bus route and, you know, a new bus line going this way. And for, you know, no one else really cared about the new bus lines, but I really cared because I couldn't afford to buy the student rentals that were close to campus. They were already too expensive. But what I realized is that a lot of renters, a lot of student renters were, were willing to pay almost the exact same rent as somebody close to campus if they were on a direct bus line to the school. So I would go, you know, a couple miles from campus sometimes and I would find a bus that was a direct to campus bus and I would buy properties that were within a few steps of the bus stop. And it, uh, by the next year, they were so easy to rent. The cash flow was great. And then other investors would recognize that these properties were now on the bus line and good rentals. And the prices would go up, you know, five to 10% in a matter of a year. And that was crazy, uh, you know, crazy sniper type moves that I was using in order to um, increase the value of my properties. Cause I honestly had to, had to buy and sell and hold. I had to do all of these things in order to grow my portfolio. So sometimes I would just sell these properties. The other, you know, if you want to put, you know, icing on top of the cake, you don't know how to understand how to make money while you're making money while you're making money. On top of that, if you want to hear the most ingenious thing I did as a, as a young investor that was um, even more interesting is not only would I buy those properties that were going to be on the next bus line before they were on the bus line, I would also per try to purchase some properties, those properties in the fall before anyone was looking for a place to live. I would close on them in January or February when most people aren't looking at properties. And then by March, when I had it and it was set up as a student rental, um, all the parents of, of students who were looking for properties next year would all come shopping in March trying to get a May 1st lease for their kids. I would sometimes just flip those properties uh, right at closing. I would close it. I would flip it. I would make like 20, 30 grand just timing the time of year that students' parents were looking for properties on the bus line. Totally a sniper move. Um, but, you know, that's kind of what you got to do. You got to hustle when you're young or when you don't have a lot of resources. You know, you have to find ways to get a few quick wins. Making 20 grand on two properties every March would allow me to get another healthy down payment to secure a long-term investment. So, Passive appreciation, it's a, it's a sneaky bugger for sure, but it's really important to have it as part of your long-term strategy because chances are, you know, cash flow is what gets you through day to day. You don't become a millionaire on cash flow. Principal recapture is great. It's nice to have your properties paid down, but one of the, the largest increases in your net worth will probably come from passive appreciation. If you're buying a property today and holding it, for 20 years, you'll probably see the greatest profits on the increased value of that property. And if you don't believe me, ask your parents if they should have bought more properties when they were your age. And if you don't believe them, ask your grandparents if they should have bought more properties when they were your age. And if you're really smart, tell your kids to buy more properties while they are the age they are, because it ain't getting any cheaper. Passive appreciation, big winner, but you have to understand it in order to uh, capitalize on it. Let's get to number four. Let's get to number four. This one is um, this one's kind of the funnest one of them all for me anyway. The fourth secret to making money in real estate that you absolutely must know is active appreciation. This is the idea of 
impacting the value of a property through renovations or improvements that you've done. These are the value added renovations. So for me, you've seen me do this in my TV shows for 15 years, right? I help people purchase or use an existing property. We fix it up, ideally generate rental income, but also add value to that property. That's called active appreciation. Passive appreciation is the property going up in value just because of time and the market. But active appreciation happens much faster. It's the impact you have by updating a space. This is why I love to buy fixer uppers, right? Because there's the opportunity to do all four. If you want all four ways to win, you buy something that needs work, you fix it up to get active appreciation, you hold on to it to get passive appreciation, you rent it out to make sure you cover all your costs, that gives you your principal recapture, and you make sure that the rent exceeds all of your expenses to have positive cash flow. Boom, cha-ching, that is the way to make the most money in real estate. You gotta understand it. There's different names for this. I'm gonna have, a, uh, I'm gonna have another podcast to talk to you guys about how, what this system looks like as part of a bigger business model, but just understanding these is critical. So forced appreciation, let's talk about that for a second. There's all kinds of different things you can do to improve a property, but you, you gotta do it right the first time because you don't get a second chance to create active appreciation. Typically it's like you do it once and you've, you've increased the value of that property and whatever you've done to it should have a lasting impression for 10 to 15 years. That way, you know, your active appreciation can be done probably every 10 to 15 years, but any more than that, and you're probably not getting the right return. Great places to start are kitchens, bathrooms, flooring, fixtures, paint, uh, curb appeal. All of these things work extremely well. Now, to give you an idea of how powerful active appreciation is, those of you who flip properties or want to flip properties, this is, this is exclusively where you live. People who flip properties exclusively activate active appreciation, and then they sell the property and they try to pull out the profits. It's a good strategy. It's not a great strategy. Flipping properties is a job. Literally, you go and you buy a property, you put your time and energy into it, you fix it up, you flip it, you make some income, and then you move on to the next one. It requires a constant contribution of your time. If you do this system, if you, do the, if you understand the four secrets to investing in real estate, what you will actually be doing is creating a portfolio of properties. The most important part of active appreciation is unlocking the speed at which you can buy more properties. What does that mean? <laughs> active appreciation is the secret ingredient that allows you to buy more properties faster because it is one of the fastest ways to make money in real estate. You buy it, you fix it up, three to six months later, you may have improved the value of the property significantly which is why it is so tempting for people to sell. But wait, don't sell that property just yet. It's driving me crazy because you don't even know that there's another way to make more money. Let me show you. It's called refinancing, right? This is where we go into the flip to yourself uh, portion of my real estate training. The idea of buying a property, fixing it up, making it worth more money, and then Pulling that equity out without actually selling it is the more profitable way of doing this because you are now tapping into pre-tax dollars, right? If you pull equity out of a property, you don't pay taxes on it. If you sell a property, you have to pay taxes because now it's considered profit. You also have expenses, big expenses for selling a property, right? Legal, you've got realtor uh, fees, all of that is on pause if you just pull the equity out. There's no, there's no taxes or expenses triggered to do that, which is why it allows you to tap into the most amount of resources in order to buy more properties. I learned this after buying my first property. It was a year later. I wanted to buy more properties. I thought it was impossible. I'm like, how am I gonna build a portfolio? It's gonna take me 15 years to, to save up for a down payment. 
when the answer was right there in front of me. It was the equity I had built up in my first property. I had bought a three bedroom, single family home that needed work. I had painted it, I put in new floorings, I did all the work myself. I then framed up and put two bedrooms and a bathroom in the basement, turning it into a five bedroom, three bathroom home. I had the whole thing rented out for $2,500 a month. It was generating positive cash flow, which contributed to my income, which allowed me to qualify for more financing. The market had gone up a little bit, which had increased the value. But the big thing was I had improved the value of that property by thirty to forty thousand dollars beyond what I had invested in it. And then when my mortgage came up for renewal a year later, instead of renewing, I refinanced. I pulled about thirty thousand dollars out of that property and bam, that was my down payment for property number two. Right? Rinse and repeat. This is how you grow a portfolio quickly is by tapping into the equity you've created through active appreciation really, really important. Now, let me recap this really quickly, because there's, there's a lot going on here. And you're probably, you know, you've got your ear pods in or you're driving in your car and you, you wish you had written this stuff down, you're probably going to have to go back and listen to it again. I, I've written this out on a whiteboard a million times. And for 20 years that I've been doing this, the formula is the same. Use these four secrets to ensure the highest potential for success as a real estate investor. Only purchase properties that either have or have the potential for positive cash flow. While you're generating positive cash flow, you should be contributing to principal recapture through the rental income. So your tenants are covering the expenses and they're pay paying down the principal balance. Those are the first two ways you're winning. Then monitor your passive appreciation because when your property goes up in value over time, you may want to pull the equity out in order to buy more properties. The, uh, the last thing is the act of appreciation, right? What can you do in order to increase, increase the value of that property right now and make it worth more money so that you can tap into equity even faster in order to hopefully buy more properties. Now I did say I was going to give you a fifth and sixth way to make money in real estate. Now these are not the beginner tricks. I mean, you can do them if, even if you're new, if you're willing to go out and get the education and kind of nail this thing as best you can from the beginning, then fantastic. Those of you who have already started investing in real estate, you're probably struggling with some of these as well. The fifth way, and actually my favorite, not the best, but one of my favorite ways to make money in real estate is with something that I call instant equity. Instant equity is about purchasing properties below their appraised value. Oh, wouldn't that be nice if we could just buy properties for less than they're worth? It doesn't work easily. And that's why this is not something that uh, uh, is, is really as common for new investors or first time home buyers. Because I, I can almost promise you that nobody has taken a course in high school or university about how to buy real estate. Every time somebody buys real estate, every time you become a homeowner, you're a complete novice. You have absolutely no idea what's going on. Um, but once you become a professional buyer, and I do consider myself a professional buyer, I have either been involved with or personally purchased thousands of properties, right? Many different units, whether it's residential or commercial. Um, I've worked with dozens of different agents and I tap their, their resources as well in order to understand how to become a professional buyer. And I have a bit of a rule. I put in lots of offers, but nine times out of 10, at least nine times out of 10, I don't end up getting the property and that's okay. I don't get upset about it. I don't get emotional. I'm like, it wasn't meant to be because my offers are not at market price. I am looking for properties where there's an opportunity to purchase it below market value so that the day I own it, I already have equity. I have a built-in security blanket or built-in profit. And typically this comes from properties that not, not, are, not necessarily were just listed today. I like to look at old listings. I might look at listings that are 90 days or older and start going to see these ones. I love it when I find a property that's got no furniture in it because I know that these people are motivated. They've moved out. Maybe I can solve a problem for them. I make sure that my offers have a lot of room to be 
um, really enticing for people, right? There's lots of ways you can negotiate in your offers. And I want to do a whole podcast about becoming a professional real estate buyer because this is critical. Now, nobody wants you to be a professional buyer. Uh, this is something that only real estate investors should want to do and do it extremely well. And you need to take the time. If you're going to buy multiple properties over the course of your career, you need to understand how to put your offers together to give you the best possible chance of securing a great deal. And that might be playing with some of your conditions. That might be, you know, balancing out um, the, the amount of things that you're including in it or the closing date, um, all kinds of different things. So understanding that fifth way of instant equity is a really solid approach. Now the sixth and final, I'm going to leave you with the sixth here because I know I'm running long. And this one I won't go too deep into, but it's understanding the tax benefits of being a real estate investor. There are all kinds of interesting um, things that happen with your accounting that are all, of course, legit and above board, but they can, um, they can save you and make you a tremendous amount of money, whether it's be using depreciation, capital gains, uh, capital expenditures versus expenses, deferring any implications. All of these things are, again, um, they sound complicated. They're not that hard. If you have someone that you can work with who understands real estate investing, an accountant ideally, then you can navigate some of these things and realize that the business model of being a real estate investor is incredibly lucrative, um, especially if you plan on having multiple properties over the span of your career. So fifth and sixth way to make money. Holy smokes, we could keep going. I'll bet you I have more. I just don't have time to get into them. So if you're thinking about investing in real estate or you're already investing in real estate, never forget, do not disobey these rules. Positive cash flow, principal recapture, passive appreciation, forced appreciation, start to understand how to acquire instant equity and monitor the tax benefits of being a real estate investor. Woo oh, that felt good to get that off my chest. Boy, you got to know these things. That's why we're here. So if you want to learn more about real estate investing, visit scottmcgillivray.com. You can always stop by the Real Estate Rebel Facebook group and leave me your question there. I know you're all I know you're all on Facebook, so make sure you've joined the Real Estate Rebel Facebook group. I pop in regularly. I try to answer questions. Lots of stuff about the pod podcast in there. Make sure you like, follow, and subscribe. Guys, the more you like, follow, subscribe, and leave me comments, the more of these I can do. Um, really appreciate you stopping by and spending the time with me. Till next time, I'm Scott McGillivray, and this is the Real Estate Rebel.